I'm Diego Cordovez. Welcome to The Scoop, brought to you by CardPlayer.com. Today we have Brian Hastings. He was involved in some legendary matches against the Silver One online, which really brought him to prominence. He won something like $6 million playing heads up, but he's also a very successful long-term online player. Now he's playing live and has had some successes, and we're going to talk about his uh, entire history and where poker is right now. So your big success was online. Certainly you grew to prominence by playing in high stakes games and a mm -hmm. famous match against the Silder. Now when Black Friday went down, some guys have moved offshore and continued playing primarily online. Others mm -hmm. have become steady grinders in live games. I know you went to Canada for a while and now you've also been playing a lot of live tournaments. So kind of what, what was the process you went through after Black Friday? Um, well, I mean, Black Friday happened, and then I knew, I knew that the World Series in Vegas was coming up soon, so I didn't really worry about what I was going to do after that until after the World Series. Like most people. <laughs> right. And then, I, and then I got there, and I kind of thought, like, yeah, I do want to play online poker. I miss it. Mm -hmm. So I decided to do the Canada thing. I was actually weighing a few options. I, I also thought about just moving to, like, Southern California and playing some live games there. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I guess that was the only place I was really thinking of playing live. Uh, I, I had some thoughts about trying to move to New York and get in some private games because I, I just love the city. But, right. Um, but yeah, I ended up doing the Canada thing for a little bit. and uh, I liked the playing online, and I, I do like Vancouver a lot. It's a great city, but it just, I don't know, it didn't feel like the right place for me to be, I guess. How long, did, long, you, time. How long did you try it? Um, I, I mean, I had a three-month lease, and uh, I took a few weeks off to go play a WSOP in EPT London. Mm -hmm. So I was there for a total of probably, like, ten weeks or something. So, like, just recently, Poker Starts had their Scoop series, which is a big deal, and yep. some huge tournaments, but you didn't make special little arrangements to go play in those oh, I played tournaments. Them. Or, oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. So you still will play that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I see myself doing that in the future, too, just kind of making, like, week-long trips or something to go play. Like, I got my account all set up now, so that's the important part. But the idea of moving semi-permanently to Mexico or Malta or something like that doesn't doesn't appeal to you? Not at all, no. <laughs> I mean, I want to live somewhere where, like, I mean, basically, I think, I guess this is the best way to put it. I think my favorite thing about being a professional poker player is the freedom it offers, mm -hmm. and when freedom, like when, when you're making life decisions based on poker, like poker is dictating what I'm doing, that's I, I've I've realized that's that doesn't make me happy. So I want to be able to live somewhere that I actually want to live, and then I, I'll figure out how to work poker into it. Basically, have you been playing? Uh, besides tournaments, live cash games too, or oh yeah, yeah. Because I mean, your your bread and butter. Some guys are tournament grinders who play 30 tournaments a day, but certainly your bread and butter was playing cash sure. games, heads up, shorthanded, and uh, so now you've translated over to uh, to live games for that. Yeah, I've actually spent a lot of time in Florida this year, um, probably a total of like seven weeks, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, just playing a bunch at uh, Seminole Hard Rock down in, uh, down in Hollywood and some other places, like I've played in Jacksonville, I've played in Daytona. Um, yeah, those, those are the main places I've played poker, but... Yeah, there's been some good games down there, and I actually recently just bought a condo down there. Um, and I'm planning on kind of being there a few months a year and playing live when I do that. And so now you have a base. Yep. But the games obviously are one table, not multi-table, right. and the stakes aren't nearly what they were online, I assume. Eh, some of them can well, get pretty big, actually. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in Jacksonville, for example, we played a 100, 200 no limit game with 50k min buy-in, so mm -hmm. that was a pretty big game. And yeah, there was some straddling. It got, it got big. Have you found that you can translate? your skills over pretty seamlessly or has, have there been any adjustments you've had to make? Yeah, absolutely. Besides I mean, I, th ones. I think at first it was kind of like a comfort level thing. I mean, when you see some pros you've only seen on TV before, like staring you down and stuff, <laughs> it's intimidating. But I think now I'm very comfortable at the live table and I think I'm just about as good as a live player as online, if, if not even better now. I mean, I think I've gotten good at le with like at least weaker players doing some of the banter things to get information <laughs> and yeah, I'm, lear I'm learning the tricks. I mean, those are key things, obviously, everything related to tells both defensively and offensively. In terms of just your game strategy, I think the conception is always that online, it's a super aggressive game and with a lot of very thin three betting and four betting and five betting. Have you had to make strategic adjustments as well or have you been able to more or less just follow some of the precepts that, that I mean, it for just you. depends how full the game is and how who the players are in the game. I mean, if you're playing eight handed PLO with a bunch of tight players, whether it's online or live, then mm -hmm. you have to you're not gonna be able to do the light three betting stuff very much. Um, but I mean if you're playing four handed PLO with aggressive players, it doesn't it doesn't really matter whether whether it's online or live. I mean mm -hmm. 
game's just going to play pretty much the same. So I guess that would be more just a function of like the, the average live player being less aggressive. Right. But I mean, at the stakes I play, it's not even really like that. Certainly, for a large part of the public, you made your name when you played a Silder, uh, Silder one, and mm -hmm. you played a s super high stakes match. Which, given what's happened in online poker, probably won't be surpassed at least for a while. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever talked to him after that, or met him live, and and had any sort of follow up? Because at the time, of course, it was a big, tense thing, and it had to be a kind of a bitter experience for him. Yeah, I, I met him once, actually, and it was <laughs> the situation was kind of funny. I was just in, in Cannes playing the WSOPE, mm -hmm. and I was walking the streets drunk at like 3 a.m., <laughs> and he went to a bar with some friends, and he happened to be there. Really? So, yeah, I mean, I went over, I tried to go over and introduce myself, and had like a very short chat. I don't think mm -hmm. he was all that into it, but... Interesting. I mean, did you have the curiosity to meet in person, or it wasn't the... Yeah, for sure. It, it's the kind of thing where I've always had the curiosity, but I've like never really known what to say, because it's just, right. it's not like your average meeting someone new, like... No, sure. It is kind of awkward, and mm -hmm. I suppose y you might be afraid that he's going to take it as you're coming over just to, to gloat or to... Even though that wouldn't be your intention, right. that he yeah. may just feel awkward. So he he wasn't too interested in in a post-mortem or any sort uh, of... I, I mean, I, I don't know. That's, that's the, the read I got. But I know he's like kind of a quiet guy in general, so... And you haven't played against him live in, turn in a tournament or anything like I that? I haven't. I've seen. I've been at plenty of tournaments where I've seen him like a table or two over, but I haven't played at his table at all. I mean, when you played him, he was still a real unknown, an enigma, correct? Mm -hmm. He hadn't revealed himself right. as Victor Blom or... Correct. People were... People were creating all these theories about who he was or where he yeah. was from. I think there, there were probably a lot of people that thought he was Victor Blom at the time. Like, yeah. Just cause because th he had that like, Blom 90s green name on whatever other site that was and he was playing really similar style and number of tables and all that. How did how did the match against him come about? Was it just a matter where he was just taking on all comers and he'd just be at the tables and you just sat down? Or had there been some build-up? Um, yeah, pretty much. Um, I mean, basically it was actually during my finals week at Cornell so I was, I was doing a little bit of of studying and um, as as you may know, I was good friends with Brian Townsend and Cole South. Mm -hmm. Still, I am good friends with them. And uh, Cole was playing Victor one day, and they played like maybe like a three or four hour session. And I, I was sweating it while I was studying, and I was like, I want to play, I want to play. Right. Like, this looks like fun. And then uh, Cole shot me a text, and he's like, Oh, I think I, I'm, I'm getting tired. I'm gonna quit soon. You want to play? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He just jumped and, in. Uh, yeah, I just jumped in. Um, when you were watching, when you were sweating, and also. F just from knowing Cole and his experiences, did you have the impression that this is just like a really good spot where you could already perceive certain uh, flaws or certain things that made you really confident, or it was just a matter of there aren't that many big high stakes games. Here's an opportunity. Let's let's take a shot. And no, see I definitely thought it was a really good spot at the time. I mean, I, um, Victor was very very good at no limit at the time. Still is. He's gotten a lot better at PLO, but at the time he was very raw at PLO, and. Yeah, I mean, just, I, I know from my own experience, when I first started playing PLO, I thought I was a lot better than I was. And right. I definitely thought it was that kind of thing. So when you had the big match when you won over $4 million, that was strictly PLO, no no limit? Strictly PLO, yes. So this was a case where, in a sense, he could have dictated the terms because he was out here taking on all comers and playing big. But I think I was denying was him no, to play no, PLO. I think I was denying him no limit action some and so were some other players. I mean, I yeah. certainly would have played him half half at least. So yeah, but he probably could have gotten a better game. It's but. surprising that yeah, he just kind of went with what his opponents were. I think he's more of a re reverse game selector than a game selector. <laughs> like <laughs> right. the, the other day online actually I saw that he was like nine tabling heads up against three different opponents, one of which was like jungle man and like, <laughs> right. Yeah. It's pretty so nuts. I mean, there's the perception out there that the real nosebleed, high stakes guys just are crazy gamblers willing to risk it all or whatever, but he may really live it. <laughs> yeah, sure seems like he it may be me. legit in I that mean, sense. Which I, not I, just I don't know much. what the terms of his stars deal are. I mean, that probably gives him a lot more cushion to do it. But. I mean, you mentioned Brian and Cole, and of course, there was a mini controversy over the fact that you guys had, in a sense, prepared together and shared data and reviewed his own hand well, histories. Just, to, just to correct that, because yeah. um, I know that that is the public perception, like the shared hands thing. So this is a good chance to yes. clarify. I've actually been meaning to do this. I was thinking about posting a blog about it recently. Um, so Brian purchased the 30,000 hands from PTR. Okay. Um, so those were not hands he'd been playing against. Uh, correct, yeah. Okay. This was a fairly standard practice at the time, though. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were doing it. Um, there were like forum posts just basically like asking about it. Like sure. it was 
full tilt, I'd never punished anyone for it before. It was like one of those things that's like technically against the rules, but nobody even knew it. Right. Um, so Brian did that, and but he he'd never sent those hands to me or Cole. I mean, okay. he all he did was he reviewed them himself. Right. And then we exchanged strategy emails, basically him being like, oh, I saw this and this and this. Right. Like he garnered some like general general tendencies. Thoughts. Yeah, like, but it wasn't that you review those specific hands correct. yourself. I didn't see any of them. Yeah. And then, the, but the three of you certainly discussed things that you consider to be exploitable, and oh, yeah, which is a, sure. a valid, yeah, which is approach. perfectly legal and within the rules. And then you played them, and uh, it turned out that the, I mean, how, how much did his play eventually correspond to, kind of the the game plan that you went in with? I honestly think the game plan is like a very overrated thing. I yeah. think it was more just me playing my game, and I mean, I'm six tabling heads up. I don't really have much time to think. It's just mm -hmm. a lot of playing the best way I know how to play and I mean noticing when he starts tilting and three betting a lot more and adjusting to right. that and stuff like that I mean you played one more follow-up session you beat him again after that I'm sure you were willing to play more but did he just kind of shut it down at um, that point? I actually played against him like a week ago um, oh, you did? When, I was up, when I was up in Vancouver playing scoop yeah I played some 1500 pilo with him on stars and I won like 100k there <laughs> so he hasn't figured out yet that you're his uh his nemesis, or I, I mean, <laughs> he's gonna I don't keep know. playing I mean, until he beats you. Granted, with that, with how high variance the game is, I mean, a ten buy and swing is not very much in PLO. So. No, but on the other hand, I mean, you've beaten him consistently, so yeah, it's still uh, only three sessions, though. I mean, we've probably played a total of I don't know five thousand hands heads up, maybe. So, but this was the first session sample. since those big ones before yeah. this entire period. There yep. hadn't been uh, hadn't been action. None. Yeah. One thing that that I think was always notable about you is the fact that. You really did balance. You were going to Cornell. Mm -hmm. You had a full course load. You were determined to graduate. And at least from what I read, you weren't. I mean, you were multi tabling and playing high stakes, but you weren't playing some crazy number of hours. No. And now that you've graduated and kind of moved on, now that poker is a big thing for you, are you still able to achieve that sort of balance, or has it been kind of a different, different mindset? Just that now poker is a big priority. Yeah, I think so. Life? I mean, I, th I think. Uh, just I'm always happier when I have a bunch of things going on in my life. I mean, if, if basically my life became like punching in the clock and playing 12-hour sessions and watching a TV show, passing out and <laughs> rinse and repeat, I don't think I'd enjoy that very much. But uh, one thing I've actually been doing that's a really cool balance thing is this company I'm involved with, uh, DraftDay.com. Mm -hmm. It's a daily fantasy sports website and created by my good friends uh, Taylor KB and Andrew Wiggins. Yep. Same, but the brains behind card runners. And you're involved in... I yeah. am, yeah. I'm an investor and promoter, and I'm actually planning on moving to, moving to Chicago after the World Series um, part-time, but like probably spend the majority of my time there and getting more involved with Draft Day. It's a great thing. I have to say, I haven't actually played on it, but you go up there and it can be for a day or for a longer period, you draft your team, and you're essentially playing heads up against other other people are playing in leagues. Yeah, it's either heads up or they have guaranteed tournaments. Right yeah. now they're actually running a series that's kind of similar to the W Coop uh, called the Dock Offs mm -hmm. and there's like eight different events. It's I mean, been a huge hit so far. They've been filling the games like really easily. And it's for real money. So, I mean, it's kind of funny that online poker got shut down <laughs> and here a game where you're not even controlling, I mean, you're you're betting on the players and how they're going to perform, well, but you can get the same interaction. The, the same fantasy thing. sports lobbyists did a better job on the UIG. Much came better. Out. <laughs> it's pretty pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> no, but DraftDay.com is a uh, is a cool site. People should check it out. Yeah, it's great, Brian. Yeah. It's been great talking to you. Appreciate coming down. You too. They're going to be successful in uh, in live poker and when you do play your uh, online session. So thanks again. Thanks, Diego. Take care. You too. Thanks for joining us on the scoop. Brought to you by CardPlayer.com.